All right. Welcome to my presentation, Competing with Free. Um, as Daniel just said, I'm Gigi. Most people probably know me as their Gigi on Twitter. And uh, as Daniel also said, I I work on Bitcoin full time, a couple of different projects. Uh, I've written a book. And um, yeah, I, I was inclined to give this talk another title, to be honest. I, I was inclined to call it Competing with Freedom. And the reason for that is because I, I, I believe that Bitcoin equals freedom. Um, that's a, a very, a very short answer to that. But just because Bitcoin equals freedom, it, it, it doesn't mean that it's free. Like the time where you were able to purchase a Bitcoin for free has, has long gone. And free doesn't necessarily mean gratis. Like we see this all over in the Bitcoin space, there are a couple of different projects, uh, for example, Samurai, Wasabi, MyNode, Risk. All of those, all of those projects are um, based on free and open source software. But to use them, you will have to pay a, a little bit of money to make full use of these uh, software products. And of course, there's Bitcoin as well, which falls into this into the same category. So I will be talking about free software for a little bit and move Bitcoin to the side. So free software, what is it and uh, how can you best think about it? If people talk about free software, they, um, they, they mostly use other names, um, like they will talk about uh, Floss or free and Libre open source software, or they will talk about open source, uh, or they will simply talk about Libre software. I will stick to the free software definition by the Free Software Foundation, um, spearheaded by Richard Stallman. And Richard Stallman defines four essential freedoms um, that apply to free software. So you need to have the, the freedom to run the software for any purpose. You need to have the freedom to study the software. You need to have the freedom to redistribute the software to help your friends. And you have and you need to have the freedom to modify the software as you see fit um, to help yourself, help others, and also distribute the modified versions. So if we look at Bitcoin, it fulfills all these criteria. You can run it for any purpose. You can study it. You can redistribute it. You can modify it. But since this is Bitcoin, modifying it is kind of complicated. So um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it would be it, it would fill a whole other 20 or to two hour, <laughs> 20 minute or two hour talk to talk about it. So what's interesting to point out is that only for two of those four freedoms, the source code is required. So there's a, a, a small difference between free software and uh, open source software. So to study it and to modify it, you obviously need the source code. Um, so there, there could be open source software that is not free, but Bitcoin is free software in, in the free software sense. And most people talk about it as open source software. So what's important to point out is that Bitcoin would not exist without open source software existing before it. Uh, and I'm quoting Joseph Jacks here, uh, who is the CEO of OSS Capital, um, a company focused on funding open source software. And I want to look at the freedoms that Bitcoin enables now. So if we zoom back to Bitcoin and the freedoms that Bitcoin enables, first of all, it enables the freedom to transact. Second of all, it enables the freedom to save. And third of all, it, remain, it enables the freedom to remain private. I think those three are extremely important, but there are more. There's the freedom to choose, like there are many um, software options and many also um, options. You can just choose what kind of, um, what kind of network uh, features to use, for example. Uh, freedom to use it as you see fit. You can use it also for non-monetary purposes. Uh, open timestamps would, an example, would be an example for that. Um, freedom to join and leave the network at will. That's very important in general for nodes, but for miners in particular. Freedom to inspect. Um, it's an open ledger. It's an open system. Everyone can inspect it. And the freedom to innovate. Um, and those freedoms, you can do good and bad with it. Like um, you could also, if we talk about the freedom to inspect, for example, we could rename that to the freedom to surveil. And if we talk about the freedom to innovate, we could also entitle that um, the freedom to launch shit coins and ICOs. But for now, let's just stick with the terminology inspect and innovate. And of course, a lot of people um, have talked about these 
freedoms already. So when we talk about freedoms, we might we uh, the freedom to transact, we might say that Bitcoin is censorship resistant. When we talk about the freedom to save, we might say that Bitcoin is unconfiscatable or immune to inflation. When we talk about the freedom to remain private, people talk about how Bitcoin is anonymous or pseudonymous to be more precise. When we talk about the freedom to choose, we say it's open. When we talk about the freedom to use, we say it's neutral. The freedom to join and leave the network, we call it borderless. Freedom to inspect, we call it public. Freedom to inno innovate, we call it permissionless. And of course, um, uh, I'm alluding here also to Andreas Antonopoulos, who often talks about the five pillars of open blockchains. And uh, I think it's just interesting to point out that the five pillars that he mentions, um, open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, public, in, in my opinion, all rest on the four essential freedoms of free software. So those five pillars wouldn't exist without the four freedoms. But I'm, I'm here to talk about how to compete with free. And um, I will focus on one of those freedoms, which is the freedom to innovate, which is the permissionless nature of Bitcoin. All right, so the freedom to innovate. Um, let's start with probably the most famous example. So <laughs> there, there was this company, BitPay. I mean, it still exists, but um, uh, the short story is that there came along this guy, Nicolas Storier, and BitPay posted something on Twitter that Nicolas disagreed with, and he replied that this is lies, my trust in you is broken, I will make you obsolete, one of the most iconic and famous tweets in, in the Bitcoin universe. And he launched BTC Pay Server and he did it. Like he made them obsolete. BitPay is pretty much obsolete now. And BTC Pay Server is one of the most important projects in space. Um, another example, as Hus mentioned in the, in the talk before mine, uh, we have Casa and they have or had the Casa node and a bunch of people came along um, pretty much unrelated, uh, like uh, Staticus and Rutzel and uh, Selco and Taylor. And uh, I've opened norms in there as well. He worked on all pretty much all these projects, I think. <laughs> so there, there are many motivated, sometimes anonymous um, or pseudonymous Bitcoiners that have certain missions. And I have a quote here by Taylor, who's said that his goal is to build the most cost-effective solution for running a full node by integrating the best open source projects. And that's uh, Taylor Hesper of MyNode and he launched MyNode and it's, it's uh, in my opinion, a great project which does exactly that and it does it for free. So um, I think Casa's hand was kind of forced. Um, they were not able to compete with free and all these projects are very dearly loved in the space and many people use it and all of those are open source. But there's a kind of a happy ending to this story. So Casa decided to open source the software of their node product as well. And if you like to run a Casa node now, you can uh, slap the software on a Raspberry Pi if you, if you are feeling inclined to do so. So um, that's a kind of a happy ending in, in that story. And um, there are more examples of the, of the permissionless nature of Bitcoin. Like there are people building messaging services on top of the Lightning Network, for example. So what you see here is WhatsApp uh, built by uh, UC Jager and um, people can use the Lightning Network to embed messages directly in this payment rail, pretty much. So you have to pay a couple of millisatoshis to communicate with each other. Um, it's still very early days, but it already works and it's quite, quite fun to play around with it. Another example in the same domain would be um, Juggernaut by John Contrell, um, a, a very, um, yeah, a very innovative and great Bitcoiner. He, he builds a lot of cool things, and that's one of the things he built. And as you can see, it's very easy to request uh, and receive and send payments in this app because it's just a messaging app built upon a payments app, pretty much. So uh, all of that is integrated already and works. All right, so you can see that. Bitcoin pretty much equals permissionless innovation. Everything we see in the Bitcoin space is permissionless, permissionlessly innovated. Bitcoin itself falls in that category. Like Satoshi didn't have to ask for permission to launch it. He simply went ahead and did it. He, he, yeah, <laughs> he just put in the work, did it for free, released it to the world for free, and everyone can do with it uh, what, what they want, pretty much. So people are building and they're building for free. So 
why is that the case? Especially if you're an economist, you might ask yourself, why is that? And you can ask yourself this question in, in other domains as well. Why are people working on GNU slash Linux, for example? Why are people working on open source software in general? Um, why are people contributing to Wikipedia, for example? There are a lot of people that pretty much do this as a full-time job without any compensation. And uh, last but not least, why are people working on Bitcoin? Which is the question I'm trying to answer here. And of course, if you're a little bit like me, you're in it for the technology. So, uh, and what kind of technology is it? I'm, I'm of course talking about NGU number go up technology. Um, as Seyfedin has pointed out so eloquently, it's the most important underlying technology that powers Bitcoin. But more seriously, I, I believe that there are two main motivations. Um, like two motivation categories, why people are working on Bitcoin. First of all, we have intrinsic motivation. So you might really be fascinated by, by the technology. If you come from a cryptographic or technological background, you might be pulled into Bitcoin because it's just um, one of the most interesting projects on the internet right now to, to be working on. Um, you might come from an ideological site. Um, Bitcoin is a very opinionated software that ideology is embedded in the core protocol itself. So um, if you align with Bitcoin's ideology, you might start working on Bitcoin because of your ideology. And I have a quote here from Adam Beck um, that encapsulates this intrinsic motivation. And he says that, ask not what Bitcoin can do for you, but what you can do for Bitcoin. And I think a lot of people are asking themselves exactly that question and just start to work on Bitcoin just because, just because it's interesting or just because they think it's the right thing to do from an ideological perspective. And second of all, there is the extrinsic motivation to work on Bitcoin. So um, you, you might fall down the Bitcoin rabbit hole because someone paid you in Bitcoin or um, you, you bought some Bitcoin, uh, you made a little bit of money with it, um, something like that. But there's also the wealth aspect, um, which I separate from the money because I think a lot of people have this extrinsic motivation to build up multi-generational wealth now. Um, uh, they kind of understand that if you fix the money, you fix the world and you can actually build up wealth over the long run. And uh, I'm quoting Marty Band here who who uh, is saying all the time that you have to fix the money to fix the world, pretty much. And I have another quote here by Jesse Lawler, who says that Bitcoin is simply an opt-in open source software with the historical reliable property of making its users wealthy. And as, as we can see, historically, this is true. And there are reasons to believe that this will be true in the future as well. But we will, we will see about that. So with intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, and Bitcoin is able to bridge the gap between these two and it, it does so in a very intricate and interesting way and has pointed that out in in the previous talk as well um that bitcoin has this kind of circular nature so you fall down the rabbit hole whatever your entry point might be and um you might be interested in the technology with it will shape your ideology over time you kind of have to align with bitcoin's ideology otherwise you're gonna have a bad time and uh you might get wealthy in the process you you will be able to make a, a little bit of money at least, and you might earn uh, money in Bitcoin, and uh, so the cycle repeats. So who is working on Bitcoin? Um, first of all, let's see who is working for open source software in general. Um, there's some research on that. I'm quoting a paper here by Bruce Perens. Uh, the paper is called The Emerging Economic Paradigm of Open Source Software, and he identified a couple of dif different groups who are working on open source mainly. So first of all, they're volunteers. Second of all, there are companies with a single open source program as their main product. Then we have companies for whom open source software enables sales of hardware. So um, uh, I'll come to, to that a bit later. Um, with service businesses, uh, governments and academics and scientific researchers. But we're here to talk about Bitcoin. So I'm asking who works for Bitcoin. All right, let's 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 go through this list. In, in Bitcoin, we obviously have uh, quite a bit, like many, many volunteers. Uh, we have a, a whole army of people working on Bitcoin. Uh, we also have companies with a single open source program as the main product. I mentioned some in the very beginning, um, like Samurai, Wasabi, Minode, and so on. Um, uh, companies for whom open source software enables sales of hardware. Um, obviously, their hardware wallet manufacturers, um, CoinKite comes to mind. 
Um, there are also uh, there's a lot of mi mining hardware stuff like that. Service businesses we have a lot of that. Um, governments not yet, at least not publicly, but they will come in time. I'm quite sure about that. And we have a lot of academics and scientific researchers working on Bitcoin as well. So one more thing about volunteers. Volunteers love sponsor sponsorships and uh, open source in general, but in Bitcoin in, in particular, of course. And it's uh, quite interesting to see this ecosystem develop more. And uh, I, I will present two slides from the BitMEX research re report that was published very recently in March 2020 called Who Funds Bitcoin Development? So Bitcoin core developers and Lightning developers are funded by a couple of different companies. Um, there are not too many developers yet that are funded by that, like uh, it's, it's below 100. Uh, but uh, you can see that this list of companies is growing and a lot of companies realize that they kind of have to fund Bitcoin core development and open source development in general. I want to point out that um, there are a couple of developers also sponsored by private donors, which I think uh, is, is quite important. And the second slide I want to show is the top Bitcoin core contributors by number of commits. I just want to point out that most developers are um, funded from independent resources. So I think that's important to point out as well. All right. Um, so I have a couple of minutes left and I'm going to try to tell you what Bitcoin actually is. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure this um, is quite impossible, but I'll, I'll try anyway. So um, first of all, I want to tell you what Bitcoin isn't. So Bitcoin is not a company. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that has. <laughs> I know it's a very great framework to, to look at Bitcoin uh, as a company. But um, as has also pointed out, it's, it's kind of an, an anti-company and uh, I, I can only repeat that. So it has no CEO, no fixed structure, no fixed employees, no fixed infrastructure. It's just a ledger and rules. And most importantly, I think the most important aspect of Bitcoin is that it can't go bankrupt. So that's what differentiates it from all other companies and most other organizations. But even though Bitcoin is not a company, it pays people, which is quite an important thing. And it also has somewhat of a, of a share price, um, like the price of Bitcoin goes up and down in value. And as Hus pointed out as well, it's partially based on utility. So um, I think that's that's interesting to point out that it has some ca characteristics of a, of a company. So what is Bitcoin? To keep things short, it's an organism. That's what it is. Um, that's a direct quote by Raoul Paul and he uh, I agree with this statement um, very, very much. So um, I, I think that the best way to think about Bitcoin is as a digital organism. And Ralph Merkel said it very eloquently that Bitcoin is the first form of, of a digital organism, like a new form of life. And it lives and breathes on the internet and it pays people to keep it alive. And um, yeah, I, I think it's just uh, obviously true if you study Bitcoin long enough that it has this organic uh, behavior. It behaves like an organism. So how to compete? How to compete with free and how to compete in this weird space that is the Bitcoin space? I have a single word answer for this question and I hope everyone uh, will take it to heart. And the single word answer is you have to live in symbiosis with this Bitcoin organism. So you have to build up synergies. You have to find a way to work with Bitcoin and not against it. And I, I have another quote here by Jesse Lawler, who said that historically, it has always been more economically rational to help Bitcoin than to fight against Bitcoin. And I think that's profoundly true. And I think it will be continue it, it will continue to be true in the future. So I hope that individuals and also companies will find a way to live in symbiosis with Bitcoin and this will be better for all. All right, that's it from my side. So thank you. If there are any questions, feel free to reach out on me. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm there, Gigi, pretty much everywhere. And um, yeah, you, you, you can find me on the internet.